Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Noise to Signal, the Biggest Problem in Data, sponsored today by Alation. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Stephanie McReynolds. With over 15 years of data infrastructure and application experience, Stephanie has a track record of bringing new technologies to market and into the hands of business analysts. Stephanie is currently the Vice President of Marketing at Alation, and prior to Alation, Stephanie was instrumental in building the first marketing team at the self-service data preparation provider, Tri Trifecta. She previously held senior product management positions at a number of companies, including Teradata, uh, Astrodata, and Oracle. Stephanie earned both her bachelor's and master's degree from Stanford University. We're glad to have her here. And with that, let me give the floor to Stephanie to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. It's great to be here today. I appreciate the invitation to talk with the Dataversity community. I would like to start with a little bit of commentary on um, noise to, to signal. Um, I am a, a mother of two sons, and so I found this, uh, this cartoon pretty humorous, actually pretty reflective of my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> uh, but the, the reason I bring it up uh, in the context of, of data is that our ability to produce, ingest, and, and store data has grown exponentially over the last um, seven to ten years. But our ability to parse out insights from that data has not. And, and you have to start to ask, why is that the case? And I'm, I am, uh, you know, I'm often wondering if our business insights are more like the tinkle of an ice cream truck five miles away or the commands that a parent gives to their children to do homework. Sometimes I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I know I have a preference there. Um, but uh, you can't manage what you don't measure, and uh, signals are often heard by those who are looking to, to find the signals. So. Um, we'll, get, we'll get serious now and we can get into the, the content of today's uh, webinar, but I thought that was a, a little bit of uh, perspective that, uh, that our attendees might, might appreciate. So what are we going to discuss today around noise to signal in your, your data pipeline? Um, we're just going to take a, a little bit of a, a look and just level set everyone on where is noise coming in the data pipeline. Um, sometimes as daily practitioners, it's hard to remember how much has changed. Uh, over the last several years in uh, data processing as well as our access to analytics. So we'll spend a little bit of time there. Um, I think what might be a little more interesting to the audience is we're going to take a look at some examples um, from major companies who have struggled with this noise in the data pipeline issue. Um, most specifically, we'll look at Pfizer, Munich Reinsurance, and eBay. I've tried to pick three, um, three customers that are representative of a wide range of industries and a wide range of types of organizations, so hopefully there's something in there for our attendees that, that sticks. Um, and then we'll dig into the next level of the problem. Why, why is this, this problem so pervasive across all industries for all customers? And um, finally talk a little bit about what to look for in technology to help um, so that you can identify whether a data catalog might be something um, that could help your organization get more value out of analytics. So what is the, the problem statement when I say there's noise in our data pipelines? Um, what do I, I mean? Um, that noise to signal ratio is an analogy that we're using to highlight um, the fact that that is represented by these statistics. Um, most organizations have claimed over the last couple of years and, in fact, have put major big data initiatives forward or self-service analytics forward, but have made a strategic commitment um, to um, using data and analytics to make more accurate, more competitive, more successful decisions in their organization. We put this label on that that we're all trying to become data-driven organizations. And yet, if you look at what's happened over the last couple of years, very few organizations are uh, claiming to be completely successful in becoming data-driven organizations. And the missing gap seems to be the ability to connect the analytics to management action in the organization. 
And this noise to signal problem would indicate that one of the challenges here in actually making decisions from analytics is that there's too much production that's happening in our organizations. Um, there's too much growth in data, too many different types of um, analytics that we can run against um, that influx of, of data. And so our, our data supply chains are overproducing. Um, no matter what level you look, like, you look at, um, there has been an overproduction of data assets. And I often think about this kind of as a production line. So when I was a kid and um, long summer afternoons, of course, I, I spent some time watching television. My parents might not appreciate me sharing how many hours I watch television. Um, but if anyone remembers this episode, I often think that this encapsulates what self-service analytics feels like in some organizations. And there are all of these data points coming your way, and you're just trying to catch up with them. And if you're like, Lucy, maybe you're doing that in a pretty elegant way, um, finding new places to put data. But if you're Ethel, you've, you've had enough. You're, you're just done. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of a fun analogy, but I think that recent data catalog surveys confirm this. Um, in its details. This is a, a pulled from a report that Howard Dresner and Bill Hostman recently did um, for Dresner Advisory Services. And this information was collected through a survey-based study, reaching out to many organizations like yourself, where they were asking respondents about um, how they locate relevant content for their analysis. And that could be either the data itself, it could be the, the metadata, the descriptions of that data, where those are technical descriptions, or maybe it's the business descriptions, business semantics. Um, and 47% of respondents indicated that they have difficulty just getting started in locating and accessing the relevant content to begin to do their analysis, to begin to make decisions. So there are there are plenty of examples where enterprises are struggling with the influx of, of data and the influx of data assets as well. What's the challenge? There are too many raw sources, be those databases or Hadoop instances um, or uh, derivative sources like reports and dashboards and Excel files. There are too many sources to be able to find data in the organization easily. There's also too many processing engines and methodologies that are used to transform data to begin to really understand what trade-offs, what, what nuanced trade-off decisions are being made by the individuals that prepare that data for analysis. Today, we not only have SQL as a, a language of choice to do data transformation, but we have ETL and ELP tools and Presto and Spark and click-based self-service data prep tools. There's logic that is instantiated in each one of those tools as data is manipulated or transformed that actually has an impact on the accuracy or perceived accuracy of the output analytic. And so that's a challenge in today's environment. And there's often too many sources of reports and dashboards at the end of the day from individuals. Self-service analytics has been great to get everyone to be hands-on with data in the organization. But how do you really know what are the more trusted individuals or the more trusted sources of data to make a decision off of? I work with a lot of heads of uh, different departments, whether those be marketing departments or finance departments or supply chain organizations. And what they tell me is it is not uncommon for someone at the vice president or the C level of an organization to ask two analysts to go and run some analysis for them and get two distinctly different answers back. How as a decision maker do you know what's the right answer? Who did the right analysis? Often it's not really a question of what is right, but just a trade off in methods and methodologies that have been used. And it's hard to understand that and be able to trust um, one of those analysts if they haven't shown their work and that work isn't transparent and I don't know how to validate those results. Some organizations are investing in chief data officers and the office of the CDOs to begin to peel this back. Um, and that is a, a trend that we 
see rising in the market and a, and a positive a positive trend. Um, I think that the the definition of the role of a CDO, if you look at some of the survey data, is also changing. So they're no longer just the compliance master of the organization, um, but they are also now tasked with also sharing best practices for analytics throughout the organization and starting data literacy uh, initiatives so that we create a, a baseline of knowledge and education for the organization on how to translate analytics back to decision making in our organizations. These chief data officers are being asked to really focus on driving change. Um, this survey I showed here was a, a Forrester survey on how chief data officers are, um, investments in chief data officers are, are growing across all industries. Um, this slide actually represents how Gartner is viewing the, the world and Gartner clients now indicate that their organizations are increasingly viewing information as an asset. Um, Doug Laney at Gartner has been promoting infonomics as a way to calculate the impact of the analytics as an asset. And that work has led organizations to focus on how do you measure data now as an asset? How do you begin to manage it as an asset? And then how do you think potentially about monetizing data as an asset? And there I think we're really talking more about monetizing the analysis as a, as a data product. So that's some of the industry research that's, that's out there about um, how organizations are starting to make changes in their investments to approach reducing this noise to signal, signal problem. I want to get real and, and talk from the perspective of a couple of customers because this is really happening in every company and in every industry and I think it's only through the use cases can we really understand um, how you might be able to put uh, best practices in place to overcome this noise to signal problem. So I've, I've pulled three examples from three organizations that I've worked with closely. Um, one is a financial services organization who is embracing Hadoop um, and late finding queries in their environment and the freedoms that, that gives individuals to analyze. That organization is Munich Reinsurance, one of the world's largest um, reinsurers in the world based out of Germany. And they started their path to reducing this noise to signal problem back in 2015. That was when um, their chief data officer started building uh, a program with Munich Reinsurance um, focused on data-driven decision making. And he started very small, just with 10 employees, trying to think about how they could change how um, their organization used analytics. And their foundation as a financial services organization already was a pretty data literate or data savvy population. They have actuaries that have been involved in the business for many, many years. But they wanted to ensure that it wasn't just the analytic experts that had access to data analytics, but it was every employee. And so they've been on a path. Um, currently, there are hundreds of employees that are using analytics to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're looking to expand that to a thousands and tens of thousands in the, in the future. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, what Munich Reinsurance put in place to help them uh, get on this growth path in a little bit. But I wanted to set up two other companies that you might have in the back of your mind to think about this. Um, and Hadoop isn't the only technology that organizations are storing data on where they have a challenge um, of data volume. Um, companies like um, Pfizer in the pharmaceutical space are increasingly moving um, their analytic environments to the cloud. This article is an article from uh, last month in the Wall Street Journal where the, the team at, at Pfizer and the, the chief information officer lays out um, the journey they embarked on several years ago to start to build out an analytics platform that incorporated AI and machine learning, uh, but I think more interestingly, build that out in the cloud and give access um, of for all of their employees to be able to run analytics. Jeff Kiesling, the Chief Information Officer there at Pfizer, is quoted in this article as talking about the fact that data science shouldn't be confined to mathematicians. It shouldn't just be the experts that have access to data. It should be everyone. But in a world of high uh, noise to signal ratio, that means a little bit more confusion in the organization. So we'll talk in a few minutes about how Pfizer began to approach that issue so that they could achieve success. 
And the third company I'll refer to today um, is, a, is a technology company in the online retail space, um, that's eBay. And so to give you a, a sense of a, an infrastructure, eBay has um, some of the, one of the largest Teradata database footprints in the world. They also have a very large Hadoop footprint. Um, and for a technology company like eBay, um, if you think about how eBay is different than, than Pfizer and Munich Reinsurance, eBay works in a slightly less regulatory environment. Um, they have um, a lot of developers and engineers on staff and a little bit of a different um, ability to give uh, raw access to data through technical tools to their end users. But one of the things they really noticed in giving more employees access to data was that data governance be became a huge issue for them. Not so much for compliance reasons, but because a lot of individuals were not um, managing their data in a thoughtful way. So I love this quote from um, Zohar Karu, who was the chief data officer when uh, I started working with eBay. And he says, the biggest sin of data governance is if a random person, any person in the organization, because that's how the, what their culture is, that every, every uh, employee has access to data, if a random person queries some data, then puts it in Excel, so they take it out of a managed environment and put it into a, a, a desktop tool like Excel, modifies it, and then puts it into a PowerPoint and ships it around as the truth. That is the biggest sin of data governance, not a compliance issue, not a, a fine from the government, but in eBay's perspective, the biggest sin is not having um, lineage back to the source of the data uh, and a transparent um, viewpoint into how that data was manipulated. Um, and as a result, managers can't actually trust that data for future analysis. And so I think these three examples give you a sense of slightly different cultures, slightly different technical challenges with how they're storing and, and processing their data. Um, and now I want to tell you what their success stories were. Because in all three of these scenarios, technology helped them start to resolve the gap um, that they had between noise and signal in their data pipeline. And not only did it help, did it serve as a technology to help them solve the gap, but all three of these organizations were able to use a data catalog to produce business outcomes, to actually get to that point of impactful business decision making. And so I want to share with you some of their transformational results as inspiration for what you might be able to do in your own organization. And I'll start with Munich Reinsurance. As we mentioned, they're one of the larger reinsurers in the world. And the pressure in their market to stay on top of development and provide new products is actually quite high. Um, their board has and their shareholders um, have expectations uh, for growth of the company. And the evolution of new nat larger natural disasters and natural catastrophes, um, robotics in our workplaces that open uh, factory floors up more so than ever before to cyber attacks, um, these trends, global trends in the world, have opened up opportunities for new insurance products um, that, that might counteract the future risks that organizations see and provide um, an avenue for new reinsurance to establish new revenue bases. And so Wolfgang Hauner, who's the chief data officer at Munich Reinsurance, um, has a very interesting perspective on his role. Um, he, of course, has put in place um, analytic infrastructure, is managing a data governance program. But when Wolfgang was in our offices a few months ago, what he told me that was that the most important portion of his job as a chief data officer is to ensure that he can support the business in making the right decisions of what new business units they can open to drive revenue in these new areas of innovation. And to the extent that each of these investments in a new business unit can be based on an analytic foundation um, of a, a new way to gain insights and data, that is of interest to Wolfgang and, and his team. And so, you know, their entire data strategy is geared 
towards figuring out and providing individuals the tools to offer new and better risk-related services to their customers. They implemented a data catalog to be able to support that initiative. So not only actuaries could have access to their Hadoop environment, but analysts who didn't have the technical skills potentially to go and access raw data themselves could use a data catalog as their portal to this new storage system for data and analytic uh, snippets of, of code. And so they have, um, they started with 600 users accessing that data catalog and have built that up now into the thousands of users um, who are accessing data through the catalog and giving input into the evolution of new business units in the organization. So Pfizer is a little bit of a different example, not just because they're a, a, a different type of company as a pharmaceutical company, um, but as you can imagine, a lot of the information uh, as a pharmaceutical company that Pfizer works with is highly regulated information. Um, things like um, physician notes, lab reports, demographics, um, information as to uh, how clinical uh, trial results. Um, there are many disparate sources of data. Often, uh, many of those sources are stored in file structures um, rather than databases. And it can be hard to get an aggregate view of that information. One of the important inputs of insights, uh, particularly for drug development, is looking at um, what they call co comorbidities. Um, where there are multiple health issues um, that may result in um, a, patient's, a patient's death and being able to sort through um, what were the, the causes um, or the interactions of more than one disease simultaneously in a, in a patient is something important to sort through um, as you're determining the effectiveness of a new drug before taking it to market. So for Pfizer, access to data in, in one place is a little less about democratization uh, of data and a little bit more about finding the most accurate models to potentially identify rare diseases. Um, the data catalog implementation at Pfizer started within their data science team and then was expanded to a larger group of users. and um, really help the, the teams at Pfizer um, work on their processes to potentially identify um, rare heart failures. Um, this was one of the initial projects they took on. And the challenge with uh, rare heart failures is that um, the disease can often go undiagnosed because the symptoms of uh, a rare heart disease might be very similar to co more common heart failure. Um, and so, identifying candidates that might be able to participate in clinical trials or candidates that might be able to help with the diagnosis based on all of all their records can be like finding a needle in the haystack. And so what the Pfizer team was able to do was really, rather than having to scan through all those materials, the data science team worked with the researchers to, um, to define some machine learning models that could in an automated way scan through all those materials and highlight um, for, for uh, human oversight who might be the best candidates, and then this human could decide who to include in the clinical trial. And so this ability to share out these models and have the machine learning do the work that would be impossible for a small group of individuals to do um, was really made uh, more efficient by uh, being able to register all of this data in a data catalog um, and, and have the data scientists uh, more easily be able to find that data and some of the query code snippets that they use to, um, to, to start the machine learning models. And so this is an example where um, you have a company in, in Pfizer that's been able to bring breakthrough drugs to market faster um, by having access to this um, technology in a data catalog. And the third example I'll, I'll share is um, eBay. We talked a little bit about eBay's, um, eBay's business um, and their intent to give all of their users 
access to data, but in a, in a governed way where best practices are, are shared, um, as well as uh, meaningful compliance with regulations. Um, and eBay has had a very successful uh, rollout of um, the data catalog as a foundation um, for um, those data governance efforts. Um, what you see in a screenshot here on the left-hand side of the screen is their business glossary, which is a living business glossary. Um, there's a group of um, data stewards um, that um, not only help with maintaining this business glossary, uh, but use it as a way to distribute and, and, and propagate updates throughout the entire organization. There are over a thousand weekly users at eBay um, of the, the data catalog that encapsulate this business glossary, and they're hoping to grow that to 3,000 users by the end of the year. What this foundation has allowed them to do is to reduce the amount of time it takes to onboard new individuals who want to make data-driven decisions because a lot of the inputs are documented in one place with examples and then really encourage reuse of some of the best practices that the information stewards um, are certifying because there's an automated way to um, share those best practices with the rest of the, of the organization. And that's given them a very solid foundation of um, not only trust in data, but ability to govern their data assets in their environment. So hopefully walking through a couple of those examples, something sounded familiar to your organization and, and questions, uh, I'm happy to uh, get into any of the, the nuances around those examples. Um, before we, we get to questions, I'd like to address why has this been such a challenge? You know, there's always some people in process that um, develop challenges in our environments when we're trying to um, democratize the use of data, but there's also some longstanding um, challenges in place that you can attribute more to how our data ecosystems have evolved. Um, and our data ecosystems have certainly created this noise to signal a problem that we're now trying to unwind a bit. So I'll take you through a little bit of history. If you um, think back to, to the 80s or the, or the 90s, an organization's data would, would live most typically in a data warehouse. So the answer to um, disparate data sources was to put all of this data um, into an IT initiative that was called the data warehouse, where we would have a single source of truth. And so ETL pipelines um, were written to be able to maintain that single source of truth data warehouse. A simple reporting layer was put on top um, in the form of um, business objects where I worked for some time, or Cognos, or, or Hyperion. Um, and it was the head of IT that controlled this data environment. So the data environment might have been a little limited in breadth, but the data was nicely organized and modeled in advance of anyone using it. There were some trade-offs though, right? So the, the breadth of the data was limited, answers were slow to trickle down in the organization, but it worked fairly well in the 80s and 90s, although most of us would say we never quite hit that single source of truth. There still were spread marts and systems under people's uh, desks sometimes that they had hidden from the IT organization. But it worked all right for the most part. What happened really um, around, started to happen around 2005 was there was this movement towards self-service analytics. And you saw this flowering of different types of data visualization and self-service um, tools. Um, and so anyone could create a report. There was no single source of truth anymore. There was no IT team that was going to distribute our reports and dashboards to us. Everyone could go and seek the truth out on their own and do their own data discovery. Um, what that led to, however, was this problem of a, a seemingly straightforward question, like how many customers do we have, likely return different answers because of the way that someone in sales might define a customer might be different from someone in finance, might be different from someone in customer success. And so depending on their definitions and the data at hand, we've, we had a proliferation of uh, different um, definitions and thus, thus different answers. And this is the era in which um, top-down data governance tools started to emerge as a way to control this environment. So the real problem today is that we have, we still have too many tools creating um, 
conflicting answers. We have more complicated code now because we've added a whole bunch of new systems to those old single source of truth systems. And um, we still haven't solved that problem of governance, although we initially told folks that it was a top-down process and procedure. And so the environments as well as the um, getting to answers just looks extremely complex in today's world. And I would argue that we're really only halfway through the self-service analytics revolution, that until we solve this problem of how to appropriately govern these environments, we won't get to um, all of the benefits of the self-service analytics revolution. And so changing this notion of data governance is really what comes next. The traditional response, um, data governance response, is to start with data governance programs and processes and workflows um, and try to, to change behaviors over months and years. But it's super expensive to do this from the top down. And to be honest, in a culture like we have in many organizations in the United States, it hardly ever works. The best that it does is to create two factions of the data users. You have the data governors and the data consumers, and the consumers rebel against these data dictators and the best practices fall to the wayside. And the, in the middle. And so what we believe will happen over the next couple of, of years is that organizations will begin to stop trying to govern from the top down and think about a more grassroots way to get to sharing best practices as well as adhering to compliance rules. That data catalogs can actually play the role not only of helping to govern data in organizations but to promote bottoms-up best practices and propagate those best practices through the organization so that best practices become available as recommendations within the workflow of data consumers. So this notion that the data governance team or a team of information stewards can use a catalog to curate positive behaviors and self-service becomes really important. Um, Gartner has researched this and validated that they believe that organizations that adopt a curated catalog will realize two times the business value from analytic investments that, than those organizations that do not organize around something like a, a catalog. Why is this important? Where does that value come from? I think the most obvious place to start is to look at a data catalog as a way to um, increase the productivity of anyone on your team who's using self-service analytics. The numbers on this slide come from surveys from the over 100 customers that we work with at Alation. And what we found is on average, um, organizations are saving from 20% to 50% uh, of time, increasing the productivity of each of their analysts from 20 to 50% by using the Alation data catalog. Um, and most of the impact is happening in the process that it takes individuals to find data and really understand the nuances of those data assets so they can come to a position of trust. State of the art several years ago to do that was a series of 30-minute meetings with all the experts in your organization who might understand the technical metadata around um, those data assets and the business semantics around how those assets were used. Today, we have technologies not just from Malaysian, but many vendors for data catalogs to help shorten that time to finding and understanding. We also believe that data catalogs, um, and we've seen this in organizations, can help get to more accurate answers by increasing the speed of documentation and the volume of documentation that's achieved. Data catalogs that start with the machine learning foundation can actually parse through existing documentation um, and make linkages uh, between different data assets where a definition is, is common, and that helps to manage the documentation environment. Um, and overall, the effect of uh, achieving reduced time to insight um, for the consumers of data. So as I've been talking about um, these examples and impacts of a data catalog, I think not all catalogs are uh, defined or built or constructed the same way. So if you are interested in looking at a data catalog for your organization, um, there are five things that, that I recommend looking for in a catalog to make sure that it will have this 
business outcome oriented impact in your organization. The top thing that I would recommend, and this is probably obvious from uh, what we've been saying today, um, but make sure that the data catalog isn't just an inventory built for IT. The business outcome impact of this new era uh, of technology is driven from the ability to surface data for the business user. So this has to be a living catalog. It has to be something that is always changing and enhancing um, the understanding of consumers of data. It's not just a, a, a footprint that's used for storing and aggregating um, a list of all of the, the data sets that you have in your, your organization. I'd also recommend that you look for a data catalog that has um, AI or machine learning technologies built into it. Um, and that those technologies are focused on delivering recommendations to the end users. So that the end users get this notion of the machines are giving me recommendations, I can accept or deny those recommendations, but there's a collaboration with machine learning here that helps speed up human processing of data. The third thing to look for is that um, does this data catalog help you with um, actually tracking all of the data assets that come together into an analytic? Does it have access to data sources as well as to the transformation logic that's been using to prepare that data as well as cataloging the reports and dashboards? And um, all of those data assets should have their own catalog page and should be linked together in data lineage so you can get an end-to-end -end view of what happened during the analytic process. The fourth recommendation is make sure there's some type of just-in-time guidance that the data catalog gives. It shouldn't be the static catalog, but it should be a, a platform by which your information stewards can um, upvote or downvote different data assets. Give them a certification. This is our gold standard and communicate that throughout the organization. And the last thing to look for to make it um, a data catalog, a rich part of your environment and see some of the um, same benefits that Pfizer and Munich Reinsurance and eBay have seen, make sure that the data catalog supports collaboration. It opens up a conversation around data. It has things like reviews and comments and rankings. Those things help break down some organizational silos that lead to finger pointing around analysis. Um, and if the technology can help with that, you'll find it easier in your organization to move the organization to analytic best practices. So if you're interested in more detail on those top five recommendations, there is a, a white paper and the link is here at the bottom if you'd like to go take a, a look and um, consider those, um, that top five list in, in more consideration. I also wanted to share um, a growing list of customers that we're working with um, who have data catalogs in their environments. Um, hopefully, for the folks on the call, you'll see a, an organization that is in a similar industry to your own or might have a similar um, business model as, as yours. Uh, and uh, I'll open it up to questions. Um, I know some folks often need to, to leave at this point in the conversation, so if you are interested in more information, um, Forrester has come out with their first uh, Forrester Wave, uh, ranking some of the vendors who provide machine learning data catalogs. You can find a free copy of that research on our website at the first link presented here on the right-hand side. And if you'd like to see a data catalog in action, I'm also um, happy to set up a demonstration for you that's a little bit more personalized information than we were uh, able to go to today and, and really see a data catalog in action. So that's the second link here. If you'd like to go to the Lation website and um, get a personalized demo of Lation, please enter your information there and we'll be in touch with you. And with that, Shannon, I believe that uh, I'm, I'm ready for questions. Hopefully, hopefully we have some good questions that have come in. Absolutely. So if you have questions for Stephanie, feel free to submit them in the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. Um, you know, and just to kick us off, Stephanie, you know, you mentioned at some point, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, the democracy. This is a key word that uh, we're hearing more and more. Um, can you tell me a little bit more of what that means to you and, and, and how you see that uh, impacting the industry? Yeah, I, you know, I think 
generally the definition of data democracy is to give everyone the freedom to access data. And I think also the tool set to be able to really perform your own analysis. And the, the tool set of being able to perform your own analysis is probably where there's quite a bit more work to do. Um, in many organizations, it's fairly simple to give end users um, access and to buy an off-the-shelf tool to say, here, um, you know, here's a, a, an easy way to drag and drop visualize your data. Um, but I think what we're struggling with as, a, as an industry is how do you make sure that the individuals who now have access to data can really um, interpret that data appropriately and apply it to decision making. And that's, that's probably where um, data catalogs and self-service data prep tools and some of these innovations fit in. And how do we get smarter about um, providing folks with the right tools to establish their own foundation of data literacy and then make that data access useful, be able to apply it to some decision making in the organization. So how does a data catalog relate or compare to a metadata repository? Yeah, that's a great question because I think a data catalog, you can think about it as a, a next generation metadata repository. So a lot of the fundamentals are the same in terms of how the back end works technically. Uh, metadata repositories um, collect information on what are the technical descriptions of, of data. That's usually the foundational starting point. Um, traditionally, metadata repositories have been really useful for IT teams um, who are looking at an inventory of data and then maybe for modeling purposes need to look up different descriptions of the technical metadata of a column uh, in a particular database. I think where, where we're seeing data catalogs take the next step is making that metadata and that understanding of the metadata first um, automated. So by using machine learning technologies to look for patterns in metadata, by using parsing technologies to automatically parse through um, query logs to see how that metadata was applied across a whole bunch of different queries, we're able to um, automate the creation of a much richer metadata repository and then turn that metadata repository into a data catalog that can make recommendations to business users about how to use that data going forward. Um, and that's what I think is really innovative about data catalogs and make them different than metadata repositories. Um, you'd have to do a lot, of, um, a lot of technical work to turn a metadata repository into a business impactful cat catalog if you were trying to build that um, from the ground up on your own and you need some machine learning and AI data science skills to be able to do it. So, you know, Gartner uses their hype cycle to show where new technologies are on that curve. What would you say is the growth adoption for data catalogs? Yeah, so I think, I think what we see right now is data catalogs are starting to cross that chasm to the more mass market adoption. Um, you know, we started um, building our data catalog. eBay was one of the original partners that we worked with back in 2012 and 2015. Um, we brought um, data catalogs to, to market and publicly announced um, Alation as a company, and there were several startups at that time that announced their companies. And I think now what you see in most of the analyst reports that are covering the market um, is that vendors have had enough time to work with enough, enough companies um, that the use cases are well known, the business impact opportunity is well known, um, and we're really you know, crossing that chasm from the early adopters to mass market uh, adoption. Everyone's so quiet today. Not a lot of questions coming over. Here we go. Um, yeah, feel free to submit them in the qu the questions in the bottom right hand corner. I'm always bragging about how you guys are so engaged, and so <laughs> keep them coming in. Um, how does a data catalog integrate with various exciting BI tools and data extraction scripts? Yeah, so I think I think most of the work out there for data catalogs has been done with um, BI tools first. Um, and so you see some interesting things happening. We, um, we at Alation happen to partner closely with uh, Tableau and MicroStrategy and um, Salesforce Einstein Analytics. And um, the baseline for, for integrating with, with any BI tool is just being able to automate the cataloging um, of all the reports and dashboards in that tool. 
Um, so we do that with all three of those vendors, um, plus a, a number of more business intelligence tools. Um, and many of the other data catalogs in the market have gotten that cataloging down where you can automate the creation of a, a page that describes the, each report and dashboard in that third-party tool. I think what's more interesting um, in the work that we've done, uh, particularly with, uh, I'll highlight Tableau, um, is the certification of reports and dashboards um, where uh, an information steward in Alation can highlight, can kind of cull through all of the reports and dashboards that have been created in self-service mode um, in a Tableau environment and really select ones that they want to promote as a gold standard for usage across the organization. And by selecting those in Alation, we then use um, API integration with Tableau um, to have those gold standard reports and dashboards show up in uh, end user, business user interactions in Tableau as certified um, data assets. Um, that's a super powerful example of, of how um, a data catalog and a data visualization tool can improve the workflow of end users by giving them a gold standard to start from then asking them every time to create a new one-off self-service analytic. Um, GoDaddy is a, a customer who's had a tremendous amount of success with that type of approach, and there's a couple of case studies on Tableau's website as well as our website describing exactly how they did that. That's great. So a um, couple more questions coming in as well. You know, how should a data catalog relate to a standard uh, logical data model? Any difference? Yeah, so, you know, I think what a data catalog helps do is to um, make a transparent connection between a physical data model and a logical data model. Um, so sometimes as um, data organizations, we have a logical data model, but it's not well expressed in one place and it's not accessible to the business. In um, many data catalogs today, and, and particularly I can speak to Alation, we have a notion of a a data wiki page, and that wiki page helps um, help the business user see the translation between a business term they may be aware of, how it's represented in that logical model, and how that logical model may tie back to several data stores um, or data transformation scripts. And so since that's all in, um, in one place, it becomes um, it becomes easy for an end user to kind of understand what's going on and, and, and grok it. So when someone says like, hey, you know, the logical model you're using is great, but it may not be operational for a month because the system is down or we're replacing the system or, you know, it's just the last hour it wasn't available because the CTL process broke, you have one place to go to to, to see where that impact was and it's more obvious to the business users versus having some conceptual concept that it, they have a hard time getting their arms around. So how does Alation discover data being onboarded on, in a Hadoop platform, data platform? Does it have a data lineage capability? Yeah, Alation, Alation does have um, the capability to show the data lineage. Um, so with Hadoop, what we see most often is that data is coming into Hadoop in a raw form. Um, then it is processed either through scripts within, you know, often through scripts within Hadoop um, into a, a derivative form and then put into Hive or some sort of database tables um, for use within a, um, a data visualization tool. And so Alation um, connects to um, not only Hadoop directly to say here's the file that that, that, that data first hit when it came into Hadoop, but we partner with um, Hortonworks and Cloudera, as well as Trifecta and Paxata, some of the, the tools that are most often used to transform data in Hadoop um, into Hive or database tables. And then we also connect um, to Hive and Presto and some of the processing engines on Hadoop to say, okay, then what happens next as that data is maybe and shipped up to a, a front-end uh, BI tool. So we can show the lineage end-to-end -end across all of those hops that data has taken. 
So if a company has poor data quality, does a data catalog help to improve data quality, or um, should improving data quality precede the implementation of a data catalog? Yeah, and this is this is one of those chicken or egg, I think, questions of where should you start? Should you start with data quality or should you start with a data catalog? Um, what a data catalog is really going to help do is surface data quality issues so that they're well known within the population of users of that data. Most data catalogs are, you know, are not deep data quality tools. Um, and the reason they're not is as many organizations have already had their data quality tools and standards in place uh, far ahead of adopting a data catalog, so there, there wasn't that much demand in the early days to build in that area. Um, and a data catalog is so focused on um, helping the consumers of data understand how to wade through that data set that, that there are features for, you know, um, collaboration that superseded um, some of the requirements. Um, so we typically recommend that if, if you have um, deep data quality issues that you do have a, an IT tool in place um, to help surface those issues um, and um, kick off uh, mitigation workflows. Um, but that the data catalog is integrated with those tools so that any issues in data quality can immediately be surfaced up to end users through the catalog. And observations that end users may have where an automated tool might miss it, um, they can log those through the data catalog and make sure that the appropriate um, individuals in IT are alerted to those usage challenges where there's, there's deep data quality issues. So how does it work for data that has either sparse documentation or reference material across many sources? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. So um, a data catalog is going to help with bringing all that documentation into one place uh, and allowing linkages to be made through, through that, um, uh, that, that breadth of the documentation that may sit over different systems. So I, the easiest way for me to think about a data catalog is rather being a single source of truth, like data warehouses were positioned. You can think about a data catalog as a single source of reference. It's not the place where you store the data. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's not the place where you process that data. It really is a pointer to all the other systems that hold keys to the answer. Um, and so just like um, we can point to data, different sources of data where different components are stored, we can also point to different sources of documentation and have that pointer coming from a central, a central place. Um, for organizations who don't have a lot of documentation at hand, what we've, um, where we found those organizations often start with a data catalog um, is by um, using the data catalog to see who the top users are of tables in the database and files on Hadoop. So we can automate the um, identification of the top users um, of different data assets and then use that as a way for information stewardship team or the data governor to then reach out to those individuals and ask them for some help with documentation. And by prioritizing the document, documentation effort according to usage, you're making sure that the, the, those limited resources you have to do documentation are best spent on the highest value impact. So is Elation able to crawl uh, legacy mainframes that use JCL, uh, COBOL, Natural, and uh, ADABAS? No, unfortunately, we are not able to crawl mainframes uh, today, but um, potentially in the future, you know, there's a, we've decided to really focus on databases, Hadoop, and um, the large ecosystem of business intelligence and data visualization tools first. Um, so, unfortunately, mainframes have, have not hit our priority list yet. And I, there may be other data catalog vendors out there that do, but I am not, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any. So that, that is um, kind of an untapped part of the market. I know that can be a challenging problem for whoever asked that question. 
<laughs> so, so um, for data lineage, is Alicia able to span cloud data lake and on-premise data sources? Yes, absolutely. We have a number of customers who are using a uh, to span both their on-premise instances as well as their instances in the, in the cloud, be those databases in the cloud or um, Hadoop instances in the cloud. Um, and so this type of a hybrid environment is one, particularly as organizations um, sometimes use the cloud for as test instances or development instances and uh, maybe on-premises production instances, um, we've seen a, a blossoming around um, those types of, of implementations. Um, customers like um, Chig and Intuit um, would be good examples within the Alation customer base. So, Stephanie, from the, um, a previous question uh, from uh, regarding logical data models, did you use that term um, the way a DBA would, a physical model, or are you asking for a conceptual model? I think that's to the questioner, but we will, maybe you can help answer. Yes. Um, so I am talking about a, a logical model can refer to a data model that is crossing multiple sources or a data model that is not physically instantiated in um, the relationship definition between tables in a physical database, but is more a, a logical model that reflects, you know, usage or design for how the data should be used, um, even if, um, but for that was, that's, you know, what I was referring to is talking about um, not, there may be a deeper question with, I would ask whoever asked that question, maybe ask one more time because it was a little bit more description as to what they're getting at because there may be a deeper definition there that I missed. Sure, and, and um, we'll give them just a moment here. Well, Stephanie, actually we are coming up right at the top of the hour here uh, and just want to say a reminder to everybody that uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session. And Stephanie, thank you so much for um, for doing the presentation today and joining us and for this, it's just been very inform, informative, I can speak today, um, <laughs> and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and all the great questions. Um, thanks to everybody and I hope to see you in the next webinar. Stephanie, thank you so much and thanks to Alation for sponsoring. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Bye.